Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ponce. I'm the public programs coordinator here at The List. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming to another one of our graduate student talks or for tuning in online. Um, this is an ongoing series that we present in the galleries in an effort to kind of make connections between some of the things that artists are exploring and some of the things that researchers are unpacking in their work um, here at MIT. So tonight we're very excited to be joined by Elena Sobrino. Um, Elena is a PhD candidate in the History, Anthropology, Science, Technology, and Society Department society program here at MIT. Um, Elena is an anthropologist who studies environmental politics in post-industrial communities and currently her research um, is focusing around the ongoing toxic water crisis in Flint, Michigan. So tonight Elena will share some of her research with us as it relates to work that we have in our current exhibit Symbionce, um, specifically this piece by Gilberto Esparza. Um, so yeah, enjoy. Elena, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I just want to start by thanking Elizabeth for inviting me to do this and for introducing me to this really interesting, really cool work of art. Today, I'm going to talk about the Flint water crisis. Uh, I'm a PhD student in Haas, as Elizabeth mentioned, and I've been doing long-term ethnographic field work in Flint in this sort of period after the water crisis. Ethnographic fieldwork is a qualitative social science method. It involves participant observation, interviews, really immersing yourself in a place and um, getting to know everyday life in that place. So this talk is kind of going to be about water and plants out in the field, um, which is obviously a very different context from this installation. In anthropology, we go out, we're mapping you know, social worlds, you know, very messy, kind of open dynamic, open-ended systems. And by contrast, this is, um, this is an exhibit that's sort of cycling water and plants in a more bounded, mechanical way. Um, so out in the field, obviously, we don't really encounter auto photosynthesis, but we still certainly see people are living with and even exper experimenting, manipulating, kind of playing with uh, cycles of toxicity and energy out in the real world. But um, before I get into that, just to give you a really quick background, if you've never heard of Flint or the water crisis, um, Flint is a city in Michigan, it's in the Midwest, the American Midwest. Its nickname is Vehicle City. It's because it was very famous for being the birthplace home of General Motors, also the UAW Auto Workers Union. Um, in the sort of recent, in the, in, in the twin, later part of the 20th century, all, a lot of those jobs were relocated to kind of largely non-unionized parts of the world. So like the US South or the global South. Um, and so now Flint has kind of, what's become kind of iconic for Flint are a lot of abandoned houses, factories, um, empty lands, kind of, uh, you know, empty strip malls, like that kind of thing. So. Flint is in really bad economic shape. Um, and it's kind of in that context in 2016, Flint switches water sources to save money. But the entire drinking water system ends up um, becoming contaminated with lead. Um, and this is you know, sort of what is the Flint water crisis. Um, the crisis happened while the city was under the authority of an emergency manager. Um, and that is just, that's an official who is assigned to cities that are struggling financially. Um, emergency managers are supposed to like get the city back on track. Um, so one unelected person was in charge of the infrastructure, utilities, water decisions, and none of the locally elected representatives or, or residents of Flint had any decision, uh, you know, whatsoever. Um, so this is obviously a pretty non-democratic system. Um, this is also a pretty racist system in Michigan. A big proportion of cities put under emergency management are majority black cities, as compared to you know, counterparts like a majority white city that might be in the same exact financial crisis, but um, is not put under emergency management. So with the water, the contamination was triggered by switching Flint's water supply from one of the Great Lakes, Lake Huron, to the Flint River. 
So as you can imagine, there's some pretty big differences between these bodies of water. Um, lake Huron is a lake <laughs> um, and it's fresh water. Um, the river, on the other hand, is an, an urban environment. Um, it was much more corrosive. So for example, in Michigan, like here, we have really bad long winters. Um, so a lot of salt is put on the roads um, to de-ice the roads. Uh, and all of that salt runs off into the river. So it, that, what that basically does is raise the, the chloride levels. And it was that kind of corrosiveness, corrosivity that um, as the water is flowing through the pipes, a lot of the pipes in Flint were made of lead. They were not, you know, updated or modernized. And um, basically the corrosive water was stripping lead away and, and it was flowing into people's homes, into their bodies. Um, so all, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting side note. There's this infrastructure built for cars and like salting the roads. It kind of came into this tension or opposition with um, the water infrastructure, you know, built to sustain human life, which is a small detail, but I think it says something about Flint's relationship with the automobile and that history with the automobile has been very ambivalent and, and difficult. And, and on that note, even aside from the lead, there were serious issues anyways with the Flint River as a water, as a drinking water source. So the river flows through the city, it's flowing next to factories that, you know, when they were in operation were depositing a lot of waste. You know, this is industrial waste that's not being monitored, it's not being regulated, it's very understudied. Um, and this is where I think we have an interesting example about the importance or relevance of cultural knowledge um, in managing local water systems. So anyone who lives in Flint, you know, just knows that the water isn't safe to drink. Um, it's just something you know if you live in Flint. And that kind of something you just know but, and you don't necessarily even know how to explain how you know it, you know, that is a kind of knowing anthropologists are always very interested in. It's something we're kind of trained to pay attention to. Um, so doing the, you know, from an anthropological lens, the river, you know, being so toxic isn't something that people would talk about very directly necessarily, but there was, it was actually surprisingly something I heard a lot of jokes about. Um, kind of dark humor, like, oh, don't swim in there, don't go fishing in there, don't um, watch out for like the dead bodies in there, like stuff like that. Um, so yeah, like to quote some local graffiti, Flint water sucks. <laughs> so there's, you know, a kind of, um, you know, the irony and joking, I, to me, it makes sense, because I think you could see that as a way to almost um, acknowledge, but sort of live with or, or kind of adapt to long-term toxic conditions, um, which makes sense given that General Motors was the city's biggest benefactor, but it was also the city's biggest polluter. Um, so there's a certain common sense understanding of water, the river is dangerous, even if it, we don't know the exact chemicals, the exact quantities. Um, so in other words, the river is kind of knowledge about the river a lot of that has been acquired culturally rather than scientifically in Flint's history. Um, how does this work, like this cultural acquisition? Well, Flint, you know, historically was a company town. So in people's lived experiences, if someone, you know, if someone didn't work at GM themselves, they probably knew somebody who did, you know, family, friends, neighbors. Um, so it wasn't a secret to like these workers or like people who were living by these factories that dirty materials are seeping in to the ground, into the water, um, you know, whether by accident or on purpose. So, um, you know, Flint residents instinctively kind of know these things about the river. They know it's an inappropriate choice to be drinking that, but emergency management, or, you know, it's essentially rule by outsiders, um, kind of banishes that knowledge, right? It just, it silences like that, the voice of people who know the environment really well. Um, so the results of that is like sensory knowledge or just like inherited memories, um, that kind of knowledge that people could have brought to bear on the decisions about the water, um, and the, the budget, right. Um, that was lost. And I think it's, it's a really deep loss. Like it's a loss of democracy, but it kind of 
is also a loss of like that cultural, that potential for cultural knowledge to be transmitted, or you can think of it as tacit knowledge, even um, tacit knowledge kind of being just things we take for granted, things that we are socialized into knowing. And, you know, we, we, we learn it through conversations. We learn it through hearing stories, telling stories, you know, telling jokes, right? So I think an interesting takeaway here maybe is that we might not always need data, like scientific data, to take care of the environment. Not that that's not important, but, you know, if people in Flint were just allowed to say uh, what they already knew about the river, um, there's like a logic, you know, there's a persuasiveness to that that might not even require like getting expensive tests, like getting expertise kind of pulled into this decision making. So, like, you know, you can just read the graffiti like it's telling you <laughs> the water sucks. So, you know, it's not that it's an either or, but I think it's important not to assume one single style or kind of scientific culture of evidence and data is the only way, the only path ever to a safe environment. So I'm going to stop talking about the river for a minute. I'm going to talk a little bit about plants now in Flint. So um, as you can imagine, with the water crisis, the kind of the big question was, let's replace the pipes. You know, let's um, repair that and, and get the lead out. Uh, what makes that kind of a complicated discussion is um, Flint has a lot of empty land above the ground. So, um, you know, like one city councilor even said he represents more land than people in his, you know, in his ward. So in numbers, there's about 16,000 vacant lots in Flint today. Um, that's about a third of all properties in Flint. Uh, 10,000 houses and buildings are classified as blighted in the city. So also some of the demolished car factories, those took up hundreds of acres of land. And that is not only abandoned, it's very difficult to reuse um, because they were sites of heavy manufacturing. Um, hazardous materials are there. And so a lot of what I've just been saying about the river applies to the soil too, right? Like it's all interconnected. So the results, there's all this empty, underutilized land. People I spoke to in Flint felt some pressure, some expectations to justify, why are you gonna build new pipes here? You know, like why put this whole new infrastructural system in place? And, you know, keep in mind the original water infrastructure was built for a city that had like twice as many residents um, at the time than, than are there today. So, you know, you might think the Flint water crisis is about fixing pipes, you know, under the ground. I actually saw a lot of the, the politics of getting resources, repairs to Flint had to do with above the ground, these issues that are, that are very much, you know, above. And specifically, what do you do with neglected, vacant, blighted land? Um, and I kind of, to my surprise, that it wasn't always the discourse wasn't how toxic it is, what chemicals are there. Um, I found that there was also kind of an equal concern with, with how does it look? How does Flint look? And so one kind of solution to this is to plant things. You know, plants are a solution. So make urban gardens, um, grow vegetables on land um, that would otherwise kind of be really aggressively taken over by weeds or, you know, people will dump trash or rubble in there. Um, there's urban planners and designers who uh, kind of are interested in parks, you know, that, that can grow um, sort of remediating plants. So that, that would be suitable for former factory land where, you know, those are contaminated brown fields, so you cannot consume the food that is grown there. Um, you can grow other things. You know, I've seen proposals to grow biofuel crops. That just means crops are planted. They would uptake heavy metals or other toxic things, and then they would be incinerated, produce energy, um, which is interesting because then there's a continuity with that automobile past, with that choice of plants in a way. Um, but what's interesting, these projects are not really about profit or scalability, like being this comprehensive solution or like solving food security. Um, a lot of these projects, a lot of their value for people would come from the aesthetics of it. 
making the lands look appealing. So the logic with that is, you know, make it look good for residents, but also maybe for investors, potential investors who might bring jobs and resources to the city if they feel confident about investing in Flint. And this makes a lot of sense if you look at how media and culture portray Flint. And you might be familiar with this term of ruin porn. Um, it tends to be like kind of photographs or images of decay, collapse, ruin, destruction. Um, this has been like a huge trope for how Flint has been represented for a very long time. Um, it tends to be like, I don't know what images come to mind if I, if I say Flint, um, but that tends to be the dominant one dimensional, very negative way Flint is talked about. So symbolically, these plants are really important because even if they're not yielding like a lot of produce, um, you know, that, that kind of success might be a motivation, but it's not the only one. Like gardens, parks, they, they can be visually sort of the opposite of ruin porn in some ways. You know, in, in those images of destruction, it's like nature taking over a factory or like an abandoned house or like something that humans made is being destroyed, you know, by nature. And then gardens, on the other hand, like they're beautiful, yes, but they also demonstrate like a degree of human mastery over nature. You know, you, you can pick that apart for sure, but you know, there's, there is a connotation there, like almost a symbiosis, right? Or like control, there's more control and balance um, when you look at a garden than when you look at, you know, plants taking over a, a, an empty building. So this is, this is just really important because Flint is repeatedly represented as a place always being in crisis, always struggling. The blame for where that struggle, where, where that blame is put is very political. Residents are always really interested in, in the difference between, you know, what are the structural causes of Flint's inequalities, of Flint's toxicity, and separating that from, you know, blame being put on individuals, on, on local behavior, choices, culture. Um, part of what led an emergency manager even being assigned to Flint in the first place had to do with like this narrative was kind of being weaponized that Flint can't take care of itself and a distressed environment can, you know, sort of be weaponized to legitimate, like to point to physical proof of, of that, of that narrative. So, you know, to put it another way, like Flint, the way Flint was failed by government industry has sometimes been collapsed into, you know, claiming Flint is just a failure itself. And in that context, plants do, people imbue plants with the power to redeem Flint's image, prove kind of vis-a-vis -vis these horticultural skills that hard work, productivity, innovation, life are still possible in Flint. And I, you know, I think it is important this kind of, you know, to understand this is this broken windows mentality. It's something people, I don't, I believe they're not necessarily choosing this and embracing this, you know, out of nowhere. I think it's much more of a strategic reaction or, or a compromise to the way like this ruination image narrative has been imposed on Flint. Um, I think that's important to, to understand. And I'll just wrap up here by saying, I think we should think really critically about this. We should ask why, why might we feel the need to stigmatize places like Flint and the Rust Belt in the first place? I think it's important we ask, what is it about deindustrialization that is so hard to confront? Um, you know, if we can only think of deindustrialization as like, it's extreme, toxic, unlivable, dangerous landscapes and places where falling into this kind of trap or myth that like it's possible to have a totally safe or like things are only totally safe or totally damaged, even though we know ecologies don't work that way. Um, you know, those, those rigid kind of distinctions don't, um, th those aren't realistic at all, right? So, you know, like in many ways we, we are on post-industrial toxic land right now even, but you know, we have a very different story about Cambridge than we do about Flint. So. I think it would be interesting to, you know, kind of imagine what other kinds of uses, what, you know, what other kind of things with plants would be happening, what possibilities would open up in Flint if that, if that whole process was freed from that pressure, from that expectation to 
react against stigma. So I think I'll leave it at that, but um, we can get into some questions about anything I've, or if there's anything about Flint I didn't cover that you want to know about, I'm happy to talk. Thank you.